guys. Welcome to the chat. Hello. Um, I decided to go ahead and sign on. I know there's a lot of you who haven't signed on yet. Um, so I'm going to give you guys some time to, to kind of, you know, get warmed up and sign on. Um, I do want to acknowledge the ones that are here, though. Um, hello, Elizabeth. Welcome to the chat. Deb, hello. Uh, B, hello. Welcome to the chat. And Jessica J, welcome to the chat. So glad to see you as well. Um, so I'll wait a little bit. Let, let everybody else kind of sign on, and then we can go from there. I was chatting with uh, just a few of you um, already. And Deb, you know, I... I just thank you. Thank you for always asking about my my concussion. It is getting better. It feels really slow, like total speed, but I'm getting there. So thank you for that. I love that. Jacob Taylor, hello. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you. I love the emoji. That's awesome. Um, so tonight, hi, Alicia Riggs. Welcome to the chat. Um, so tonight, I think we're going to talk uh, you know, we're going to talk about some complicated things. My goal is to, to wrap up by seven o'clock. Uh, please hold me to that. Um, I really do need to, to stick to my times. Um, but you guys are so entertaining and wonderful that I always go over. Uh, but please hold me to that seven o'clock time. Okay. Um, welcome Paige Matodi. Welcome. Glad to see you. Hello, Sammy. Welcome to the chat says, hi, Tamara. I just found your channel a few days ago and it has helped me cope with my toxic family. That's wonderful. Welcome to the channel and welcome to the chat. Hello, it's been called lately. Welcome to the chat. So glad to see you. Thank you so much. Blessings to you. Um, yes, you're welcome and thank you. Uh, <laughs> Deb, you should not be nervous. I don't know why you're nervous. Um, if you're nervous about the topic, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie and say it's not a uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and, and say that it's going to be a good topic because, you know, it's a tough one. So I've got some intricate things to mention. I want to make sure that I stay on track, right? Because, you know, the topic of post-betrayal syndrome and betrayal and deception uh, within a family context, within relationships, it's a complicated topic. So, uh, you know, I'm going to delve in and uh, let you guys sign on and get comfortable and, and start your chatting in the chat box like you always do. Let me, before I jump into the topic, let me just welcome Mark Taylor. Uh, welcome to the chat, so glad to see you here as well. Yes, yes, good to see you too. Um, so let me jump in, okay guys? So I, I did a video last Sunday uh, on post betrayal syndrome and I didn't think that it would get a lot of traction because a lot of people are uninformed about what post betrayal syndrome actually means. So, you know, when I did the video, it was really like an introduction. Um, but after, I'm going to say about four hours, it ended up catching 1,000 views and then it kept going. And that's because I think, you know, as people watch the video, they, you know, watch the video during that day, they realize, like, wait a minute, you know, maybe I am suffering from some betrayal, you know, maybe that is me and maybe that's me. Oh my God, she just mentioned that concept. Maybe that's me. So those people reached out to me and said, hey, Tamara, can you talk a little bit more about this? Because I think I'm dealing with post betrayal syndrome. And so that's why we're here again tonight. But I'm also going to mix in a couple of things. I'm going to tell you tonight what you may be experiencing because of betrayal in your world, because of betrayal in your history, in your life. Um, and then I'm going to give you some tips on how to move forward. So uh, stick around for that. So let me jump into what this means. Post-betrayal syndrome is basically the concept or the idea that you have been betrayed, not betrayed once, not betrayed twice, but betrayed multiple times or several times in your life. And what makes post-betrayal syndrome 10 times worse is having what we call a second level trauma, okay? A second level trauma would be something like, here's an example, would be something like, you know, you have been betrayed by your parents, your parents were substance abusers, they were narcissists, and you've been betrayed by them. And so you're hurt. Now you're put into the foster care system. Let's say you're 8, 9, 10, maybe 15. You're now put into the foster care system. And now you have to deal with foster parents who may or may not be loving. Mostly, most likely for this example, they're not loving. They're cold. You know, they're disengaged. They're detached, right? So then you end up back into the foster care system. And then you're adopted, 
Okay, this is a, an elaborate example. Now you're adopted, but now you're adopted by people who are narcissists, you're adopted by people who are toxic and dysfunctional. And so now you feel not only betrayed by your biological parents, your foster parents, your adopted parents, but now you may feel betrayed by the adoption system itself. Okay, so that would cause what we call second level trauma. It's my first level trauma has been a parent, a caregiver, somebody that I've trusted. Now, on top of that, you know, first level trauma is now an additional trauma, which is most likely an institutional trauma, a foster care system, an, an adoption system, a mental health system, whatever. That creates what we call secondary trauma or second, second level trauma. Okay, so so post betrayal symptom can a uh, syndrome, excuse me, can get pretty complicated. Now you want to keep in mind that that there is often if, if you've experienced post betrayal syndrome, there is often a conflict between your emotions and the psychology of who you are. Okay, so here's what I mean by that: you've been betrayed so many times, and and it's hard for you to grasp why. You know, if there's no answer, right? It's not like you underperformed or you did something wrong and that person did something to you. The betrayal is out of the blue. It's unwarranted and it may totally change your life for the worst, right? It's hard for you to trust. It's hard for you to figure your own life out. It's hard for you to understand your own emotions because now whoever has betrayed you, now they've created a situation where you feel traumatized, right? So there's a there's a conflict between how you feel and how you process your life. You may feel a certain way, but the psychology of who you are has changed as well. You can't attach to someone emotionally because you're afraid, and psychologically you are you are afraid. You're terrified of trusting. So there's often a conflict between between your feelings and your thoughts, okay? To make it very simple. There's also attempts at preservation of an abusive relationship. If you have post betrayal uh syndrome, there's often uh this this attempt to preserve the abusive relationship. Here's an example. Your dad's a psychopath. He does whatever he wants to do. He's cold. He's callous. He has no empathy. You know, he doesn't know how to love anybody. He's ice cold. Okay. He's callous. He's mean, evil even. And, and let's say, you know, he's the only dad you've ever known, even though he's a, a pretty, he's a pretty messed up dad. He's the only dad that you've ever known. And you want a dad right? You love your dad. So you might find yourself angry with him for not being a good father to you. But on the flip side of that, you may try to preserve that relationship because you just want a dad, right? So there may be attempts at preservation of that relationship. Institutions may also trigger post-betrayal trauma. Institutions like the mental health system, that's an institution in and of itself. If it's done something to you, betrayed you, made you feel uncared for, uh, neglected you, didn't give you the right level of care, you didn't have a really good therapist or a psychiatrist, or they've turned their back on you, you feel, or you've been traumatized by other mental health professionals or psychiatrists, the list goes on. Whatever the issue is, an institution can trigger it, especially if you've been betrayed, you feel like you've been betrayed several times in the past, an institution in and of itself can trigger post-betrayal syndrome. Uh, an institution such as uh, a school system, okay? If you feel like it's failed you, if it's never been something that you've enjoyed, if it's never been something that, that has benefited you in any way, you may feel like the institution of education in the nation has betrayed you. That can trigger post-betrayal syndrome, especially if you you feel like you've been betrayed several times by that institution. Um, also, too, before I go to the chat box and, and look at your wonderful comments, I see you guys chatting along there, you want to keep in mind that, that post-betrayal syndrome is not a clinical syndrome, okay? It's not a clinical syndrome. I can't go to the clinical manual that we use to diagnose and find post-betrayal syndrome. Post-betrayal syndrome has what we call clinical implications, meaning it has some clinical value. It's not a diagnosis, and it's not something that we can put on your medical record, but what we can say, because it has some importance, 
especially if you have CPTSD, complex PTSD, and especially if you have PTSD, there most likely is some post-betrayal trauma that you're dealing with. So here's how I would typically put it in a medical record. I would say something like, Kelly has experienced post-traumatic stress disorder for many years. She was sexually abused by her dad. She was betrayed by her mother. Her mom put her in the adoption system. Uh, grandma was nowhere around, betrayed her when she was 20. Uh, she, she flunked out of college, and her boss fired her. I believe that clinically she has some post-betrayal syndrome features. That's important to pay attention to. That's how I would make that a clinical record. Okay, so a lot of providers will use the clinical language of post betrayal syndrome or post betrayal, you know, clinical features to put it in the record that this person has suffered from multiple betrayals over time. But we cannot diagnose that, unfortunately. It needs to be one. Kind of see, kind of see post betrayal syndrome as being on the same level of complex PTSD. It's not a diagnosis, but it has a lot of importance for clinical, for clinical matters. All right, let me go to the chat box, all right, uh, just to see what you guys are saying. Um, okay, let me keep going. So, um, Jessica J says, so sorry to hear about your concussion, Dr. T. Blessings to you. I was in the hospital Wednesday and improving. Please take care. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica J. And um, I, I saw your comment that you sent me uh, a couple days ago that you were in the hospital, and I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I, I just, I, hopefully it was a good experience. I, having worked uh, in psychiatric hospitals uh, for three years, over 12 years ago, uh, you know, they're really difficult places to be. So um, I, I hope the experience was an okay one, a pleasant one, um, and very sorry to hear that. At the same time, if you're doing better, then that was a good move, and that's good to know. That's good to know. Deb says, recognizing that the narcissist never loved you is soul deep betrayal. Even at age 50, it hurt. Recognizing my parents and sister didn't actually love me. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I would say I would say recognizing that you weren't ever loved is a soul deep betrayal. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say, for example, you're dating someone or you're married to someone and you guys have been together for so many years. You're under that that impression that you are loved, that you are cared for, that you are embraced by that other person. And one day you happen to walk by and see a cell phone and it's another woman or another man's text message saying, I'm looking forward to meeting you tonight. That is so deep betrayal, right? You've been married maybe for 25 years. You've been dating for, you know, in a, in a, uh, uh, committed relationship for years. And then all of a sudden you realize that there's an affair and you don't know where that came from. That is definitely soul deep betrayal. Another soul deep betrayal may be something like you thought for the past 19 years of your life that your parents loved you until one day they tell you that you were a mistake. Then there's another soul deep betrayal, you know? So it gives, it gets pretty um, skin deep, as they say, and post betrayal syndrome can really become uh, it can really become an issue for you as you continue to you know walk along in your journey. And I'm going to tell you why in just a little bit. Hi, Dawn One, welcome to the chat. So glad to see you. Welcome. It's been cold lately. Thank you for that contribution. I always love your contributions. I tell you all the time, you don't have to, but when you do, thank you. That tells me a lot. It does. Thank you. It's been cold lately for your contribution as well. Um, I always love that. Thank you. Julian Molony. Hopefully I said that correctly. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. It says, hi, everyone. Thanks for, all, thanks for all the helpful info, Tamara. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Nurse Ratched Wellness, hello. Welcome to the chat. I don't ever remember seeing you or Julia Maloney. So welcome to the both of you. Alicia Riggs, she says, does it, oh, does it comorbid with post-traumatic stress? Like if you experience a traumatic event by the person who betrayed you and have both symptoms of PTSD and post-betrayal syndrome, 
Excellent question, Alicia Riggs. Um, yes, absolutely. So here's what happens. Let's say you've been betrayed over the course of your lifespan, right? You were betrayed by your parents. Let's say you were five. Your parents left you. Your grandparents raised you. Then you felt betrayed by a boyfriend at the age of 18. Then you felt betrayed by maybe the, the educational system because you flunked out of college. Then let's say you've been betrayed by your boss at the age of 32 because somehow they favor other workers and he decided to fire you. So there you are with this whole boatload of betrayals, right? And you feel like you can't trust anyone. You feel like no one is there to support you. You feel like no one is there to really get you and understand you. Can you experience PTSD because of that? Yes, absolutely. What happens is the brain can only the brain can only take but so many betrayals before it starts to become paranoid and worried and depressed and anxious and unable to function in relationships in a healthy way. I'm going to tell you in a little bit some symptoms and signs that you may see in yourself that signals that you're struggling with all the betrayals that you've experienced. Now, betrayal in and of itself, excuse me, does not necressarily equal PTSD or complex PTSD, but, but can can you experience PTSD and CPTSD and then also have all these betrayals and experience post-betrayal syndrome? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have a 45-year-old client right now uh, who is struggling with complex PTSD, uh, and she she also has PTSD from a car accident um, and a fire. She Her grandmother's house burned down so many years ago. So she has PTSD. She also has complex PTSD, and now her husband of 35 years has decided to have an affair, and he's had about 20 affairs, believe it or not, multiple affairs, and she's just now finding out this information. She's also, and this is just me giving you an example of what this this syndrome actually means. She also found out that he's been spending thousands of dollars on the other women. So so they, you know, they don't have any longer, and this is what, you know, this is what we've been grap grappling with in therapy. Uh, they don't have a retirement fund anymore because he's been spending all the money on these different women, okay? So, so she has some PTSD, complex PTSD, and then she's got post-betrayal syndrome. She's scared to death to trust anybody. She's scared to death to trust me even so okay all right guys let me keep going and then that was a great question alicia riggs by the way thank you for that i'm going to keep going because i don't want to miss anything and then we'll get back into the content elizabeth she says i usually think people are dirty and there is no one there is no one who deserves my trust because anytime i give trust to anyone they abuse it yes that is difficult um i will say uh, my my great grandmother used to tell me all the time, try the spirits, which means try that person first. See see what you get intuitively for that from that person, and then go from there. Sometimes you can intuitively get a very positive signal, right? It feels good, and then later you realize it wasn't good, right? So sometimes it's hard to trust your intuition, and sometimes it's hard to trust even what other people may tell you about somebody too. Right. Positive reviews doesn't always mean the person's a good person. But here's my point, Elizabeth, that it's good to it's good to kind of protect yourself and keep your walls up. But then you want to make sure, too, that you don't have what we call rigid boundaries. Um, I just talked about this today with a client. Rigid boundary says I trust no one. I'm going to give no one a chance and I'm going to keep my walls really firm. And sometimes you miss out on opportunities because of that. That's a tough one. My mom has rigid boundaries. Let me tell you, that, that, that's that been difficult, okay? Because being an adolescent, myself and my two brothers, that was rough. And we weren't allowed to have sleepovers. That's how, that's how rigid my mom was. My mom was afraid for our safety. And so she wouldn't even let us have sleepovers. She didn't trust other parents and she didn't trust other kids, which I'm grateful to her for that. Um, because on a lot of sleepovers, this is a side note, on a lot of sleepovers, sexual abuse can, can happen. Um, and there's research to back that. But my mom's gone through her life because she has trauma. Um, she's gone through her life with, with you know, really rigid boundaries. So, um, Elizabeth, take that for all it's worth, okay? <laughs> but I don't blame you. Caitlin Brown, hello. Welcome. Glad to see you tonight. Glad to have you. Yeah, Jacob Taylor says, my neurologists and um, neuro-oncologists betrayed me. Sorry, guys, if you hear a vacuum, that's our, that's our maintenance. I'm sorry about that. 
Um, Jacob Taylor. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, maybe give me some information on how that is, because I'd like to tease and pull that apart a little bit for everyone. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Sammy says, not being able to trust people is rough. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Your life gets really bumpy, really rocky. Rochella, hello. I hope I'm saying that right. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you as well. Yeah, it's been cold lately, says it's hard wanting connecting and it's hard wanting connecting and friends so badly, but feels impossible having spent my entire life alone or entire life alone. It's hard not most understand. Yes, it is hard and not most understand. You're correct about that. Um, I, I will tell you for me, and I've always been this kind of a person where I'm very private. You only know what I tell you and you only know what you observe from me because I keep my life really, really private. Part of that is because of the work that I do. The other part of that is because I'm so visual in the community. You know, people know me a lot. Um, and the other piece of that too is how I was raised. So my literal, my, li I'm going to give you this example, my, my literal home okay, is like a hidden oasis, <laughs> like tall evergreen trees, like that's literally, that's literally how private I am, so I guess you could say I'm, I have rigid boundaries in some ways, um, so I, I don't really blame you, it's been cold lately, um, at the same time, everybody does kind of look at you a certain way, right, my neighbors look at me, and they're like, why, like, why all these, like, why evergreen trees, like, can we at least have a peek over into your property, you know what I mean, um, even with my colleagues, I have a really good colleague, and he's like, why don't I know much about you, I know about your family, I know about your interests, I know about your work, but, like, what else is there to you, and, and that's because I'm so very protective and rigid, right, um, so not a lot of people understand, you know, and that's what can put us in a really difficult standing with society because we kind of come across as mysterious, right? Or you have people asking you questions like, why aren't you more open, sociable, extroverted? Because I don't want to be, I'm comfortable here and you don't need to know all there is to know about me either, you know? So you're right. It's been cold lately. It's, uh, it's a pretty difficult spot to be in. It is. It is. Um, I, I'm going to tell you guys uh, in a little bit here after we get back into the content, uh, more towards the end of this live chat, I'm going to tell you how to move forward and how to do it in a healthy way and how to kind of give of yourself and yet protect yourself at the same time. Uh, Jessica J says, my longtime psychiatrist said uh, she would always be there for me. She then refused to see me after my mother died. I was devastated and trust issues with doctors has been difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'm sorry, Jessica J. That is not a good feeling. Um, I, I have a lot of clients who have come to me after feeling betrayed from other doctors and other therapists. Let me just say, uh, uh, as a way to respect my profession and to support my really good colleagues that sometimes, sometimes as professionals, uh, doctors, psychotherapists, clinicians, whatever, therapists, we want to be there at all times. We want to be there to support you, but the law sometimes has it has us restricted, right? Sometimes we can only go beyond a certain boundary and then we have to step back because of our professional license, because of our ethics code, because of the law. So sometimes a refusal is not necessarily a refusal of you. It might be a recommendation from the police. It may be a, a recommendation from that place that the therapist works for. It may be a recommendation from our ethics code or our ethics board. The other part to kind of consider here is sometimes there are really inexperienced professionals caring for you and they don't know how to, how to handle things. And so sometimes they either abruptly pull out of your life or they promise you things that they can't uphold you know, um, or sometimes they realize that I got myself too far in and now I have to reel myself out. And that may me that might mean slamming the door on that client because you don't understand I can't help you. Right. So there's there's various ways to kind of look at that. So just so that you guys don't feel um, post betrayal syndrome from the mental health system at all times. Those are a few examples of reasons as to why professionals may have to 
back away. Doesn't always mean you're being abandoned. I hope that kind of helps, Jessica. Um, yet at the same time, I totally get you because there are some providers who are very unethical and they do just leave you alone or refuse to talk to you. And that's not how that's supposed to go. Um, okay, Deb says, what does it say about me that I really like my own company and I feel less need to connect with other people now that I'm healing? I think it says that you're very content in yourself. I think it says that you're most likely an undercover introvert. I think it's it's um, important for you to also believe that you are, are doing a healthy thing for yourself. You don't have to be sociable. Some of my Some of my kiddos, the kids that come and see me for therapy, sometimes they're like, they'll sit down on this couch and like, hey, Miss Tamara, my my mom wants me to go play football and go play basketball and go hang out with my friends and go to school and then do some after school activities all in the same week because they don't want me sitting in my room for thousands of hours. I don't want to do that though. And here's what I'll say to the kids. I'm like, nothing's wrong with that. Like you, you don't have to be sociable 24 seven. You know, it's okay if you do some basketball on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and maybe on Saturday, you want to go hang out with your friends and all the other days you want to be in your room, getting to know you, getting to understand your mind, processing life, sleeping, napping, growing, learning, all of that. So Deb, it's okay. That's basically my point. It's okay. Um, I don't know how to, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this. L. Cone Jitto 99, I hope I have that right. Uh, forgive me if I don't. Welcome. Says, um, finally, I caught a live once again. Yeah, glad to have you. Glad to have you. All right, let me get back into the content, okay, guys? So, so basically, I talked about what post betrayal syndrome is. Let, let me tell you what research says can happen to you if you are experiencing post betrayal syndrome. One thing is loss, grief and PTSD or CPTSD. You've been betrayed over, you know, uh, you know, over your lifespan. You have, you've had several incidents where you've been betrayed, right? So then you can suffer from loss, the feelings of loss and the feelings of grief. Now there are five stages of grief. You guys are probably aware, aware of that. I'm not going to go through them. I'll post that information in the description box for you, but you can experience the stages of grief, anger, depression, denial, uh, bargaining, right? Um, kind of, kind of saying, you know, if I do this, then maybe I'll get this in return. Uh, and you may also feel like you've experienced some acceptance of the betrayal, but then you may find yourself back in denial, depression, anger. So, so that's the, that's the grief stages you can experience. You can also experience self-doubt and low self-esteem right? What didn't I understand here? How could I let that person continue to betray me, right? How come my mother put me in the adoption system and didn't raise me? You know, why does she betray me like that? Um, and then there's also anger, anger, anger that kind of stays pinned up inside, okay? So, so research suggests that you're likely to experience all of those things. But there's also other research on gang stalking, there's a little bit of research on gang stalking. I'm going to post that in the description box below. Gang stalking, generalized stalking, right? So just being stalked by different kinds of stalkers. Uh, toxic families that can cause certain symptoms. Uh, and also post-betrayal syndrome. So here's, with all of those things, here's what you can experience. You don't have to experience one of them. You could have experienced all of them, right? So here's what's likely to happen. Research suggests that neuroticism, Neuroticism, I'm going to explain it in a little bit. Neuroticism is something that you can experience if you have been betrayed over a long period of time or several times throughout your lifespan. Neuroticism is basically uh, the idea that, you know, you're, you're kind of anxious about life, maybe uh, so anxious that it's hard for you to kind of settle, right? You're constantly on the go. Your mind is racing. Your emotions are always over the place. You're having a really hard time. Sorry, guys, I hit the wrong button. You're having a really hard time, you know, grasping things because you're just kind of all over the place. You're nervous and everything is a big catastrophe and everything is exaggerated and you know there's a lot of ideas that preoccupy your mind and you don't know which one to believe right that neuroticism neuroticism can happen if you've been betrayed over a long period of time you it's like this undercurrent uh functioning that's that's unhealthy right you're nervous and you're anxious about what's going on in your world and it's hard for you to settle research that speaks about neuroticism and post-betrayal syndrome 
syndrome shows that if you have high levels of neuroticism, right, it's really hard for you to settle in your life. You're always on the go and nervous and anxious and impulsive and, you know, you're always panicking like high levels of neuroticism equals a higher risk. I'll put it that way, a higher risk of PTSD and CPTSD. So neuroticism already predisposes you to, to, to being impacted by complex PTSD and PTSD. That's pretty scary, right? Um, if you have this foundation, if you have this predisposition to neuroticism, you can also start to experience depression and anxiety, um, and you can also suffer from uh, social factors that are in, impacting you, right? If you've, had, if you've been the victim of multiple affairs, if you've been cheated on multiple times, if your parents have betrayed you multiple times, all of that can, can cause PTSD and CPTSD. So if you have that, that predisposition to neuroticism, PTSD and CPTSD is likely. Um, if you've been betrayed multiple times in your life, you can also experience detachment or dissociation. So let's say you've been betrayed by your family thousands of times, right? Now you're experiencing this place where you, you just can't wrap your mind around how many times you've been betrayed in your life. Y your questioning has now become, what am I doing wrong, right? Am I doing something wrong? Am I to blame? for being betrayed these many times in my life? Is it who I am? You may even start to have suicidal thoughts. All of that can lead to emotional and psychological detachment and dissociation. Detachment, you may notice within yourself, if you're talking about yourself from a third person kind of, kind of view, right? She or he does, as opposed to me, I, right? Um, or you can feel really disengaged from everyday life. Um, I remember having a client that was disengaged from everyday life because she experienced so much PTSD and CPTSD and betrayal that when I would talk to her about her trauma, she would laugh. It was funny to her. And I, I remember during the first session uh, that I had with her, she said to me, um, let me just let me just warn you, I laugh a lot. And I laugh a lot because I have a hard time accepting my reality. And every session just about where I brought up her abuse, I brought up her trauma, I brought up her failed marriages, she would find something funny to laugh about. It was emotional and psychological detachment. And she would do it unintentionally. That was the scary part about it. Um, you can also feel very empty inside, right? Like you're absent. Like you have literally been taken out of your own body. You can have that kind of a detached feeling. Dissociation, uh, you guys are well aware of, you know, it's almost like this severe form of daydreaming. You know, you may have these laps in times. Um, I'll give you an example from my own personal life. I've, I've never had um, any childhood trauma or any kind of adult trauma. Um, but as, as a new person in my role as a therapist, I'm going to say 10 years ago, uh, I, I had a really heavy caseload. And I'm talking about People who had schizophrenia, they were delusional, they were seeing and hearing things, uh, custody battles where it pulled me into the court system. I had legal issues with families who would pull me into their divorces. Like I had some really, really tough cases. And I remember getting in my car driving home. I had an hour drive home. And I lit by the time I got in my car, started it up, and backed out of my parking space, I would dissociate. And by the time that I got maybe 30 minutes into my drive home, I remember either pausing at a stop sign or pulling into my driveway, and I thought to myself, I don't remember passing any red or green lights. I don't remember passing any stores or gas stations. Where was I? You know, And it was kind of like all this pressure that I was under was causing this dissociation. And so if you've been betrayed multiple times over your lifetime, and, and, and let's say you're experiencing a new betrayal, that compounds all the trauma and betrayal you've already had, and all that pressure on top of you can lead to dissociation, a lapse in time. You don't remember what happened 15 minutes ago. You don't remember what happened 30 minutes ago. Okay, or you can feel like you've, you're being snatched out of your body. Your mind is somewhere else. I'm sure you guys are probably like, oh my God, I can relate to the driving thing because I drive and I stop at the stop sign and I don't even remember that, that I did five minutes ago. You know, that's a common form of dissociation. 
Um, and you might experience psychosis, right? So let's say you have PTSD, you have post betrayal syndrome, and you just can't trust people, right? So you have post betrayal syndrome and PTSD. If, if you have additional stressors that's on top of that, and you find that you're kind of losing grasp with reality, it's possible that you can experience hallucinations, hearing and seeing things that's not there, delusions, believing things that are not true. There's no way they could be true, you know, but you believe them. You can also have thought disturbance where your mind is kind of scattered and it's hard for you to really function in daily life. You can't think, you can't talk, everything comes out like jumbled letters. Your mind is just kind of all over the place. Um, and you could also experience, uh, you know, kind of like this, um, this, this state of daydreaming, right? You feel like you're floating and, and you're kind of just existing. You're not attaching to things, you're just existing. Um, and lastly, as the signs and symptoms that you may be experiencing, uh, borderline personality disorder, like symptoms and behaviors. If you've been betrayed multiple times, you're dealing with post-betrayal syndrome, you're dealing with complex PTSD, now you're in another situation where you feel betrayed, you, you have all this pressure and stress on top of you, you can start showing borderline personality disorder-like behaviors. An example of that would be impulsivity, you're really impulsive in relationships. You jump into them too quick or you, or you do things that are risky. Uh, relational anxiety, you fear abandonment, right? Or you have a very insecure attachment to that person that you're in a relationship with or you, know, you have this, this insecure attachment to a family member, right? You may also get so escalated in your emotions that now you start to threaten other people or you threaten your own life. I'm going to kill myself. Um, and lastly, you may engage in self-harm. And so these borderline personality disorder-like behaviors can show up if you've dealt with PTSD, complex PTSD, and post-betrayal syndrome. Woo, that was a lot. Okay, let me go to the chat box, guys. I'm going to take a breather. I'm going to take a minute here, and then we're going to get back into how do you move forward, and then we're going to wrap up. All right, let me go to the top chats because you guys are – Offering contributions. Thank you so much for that. Um, USMLE shortcuts. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. And thank you very much for that contribution. Contribution, if I can speak. I always say thank you, even though you guys don't have to do that. I'm always grateful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me go back to. All right. Let me go back to the chats. Hold on, guys, because you guys are just chatting away and I don't want to miss anything. Josh different hello welcome to the chat glad to have you tonight welcome <laughs> b says are you a cancer tamra you sound like me oh my god i am not you want to know what i am i don't even know if i want you guys to know what i am because my brothers make fun of me uh all the time i'm a gemini i'm a gemini i'm a may baby I'm a May baby. And uh, a, one, of my, one of my brothers, they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you're surely a Gemini because you switch up, you know, which is kind of true. It's kind of true. It really is. Uh, if you give me a reason to switch up, I might switch up. I might. I might. All right, let me keep going. Mel Kep, hello. Welcome to the chat. So glad to have you tonight. The Puzzled Goddess, hello. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. The puzzle goddess says, Hi Tamara, used to used to overtrust. Oh, used to overtrust. Absolutely, absolutely. So so your boundaries would be considered porous, right? They're very flexible. You trust just about anything. Um, or you did. Uh the puzzle goddess says I've needed to forgive myself and learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very good point. Very good point. Bear with me, guys. I'm going through all these comments. EB, hello. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. Says, I am just like your mom still in 2023. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, my mom's very guarded. I, my, my older brother used to tell my mom all the time. Um, he's like, I don't want to introduce... He's married now with kids, but... Um, but but when he was dating, he used to say, I don't even want you to meet my girlfriend's mom. I, I really don't. And my and my mom was like, 
uh, why is that? And he's like, because you're so obvious. My mom has this look, okay? And this look says, I don't trust you. I really don't. I tend to be the really sweet one. So so when we're out in public, like people gravitate towards me. Um, and then they look at my mom like, whoa, what's wrong? Because my mom has this face that's like, mm -mm, don't try me. Don't try me. She's the sweetest person in the world, but she's got this look. It'll intimidate you. Um, Elizabeth says, then you get a schizophrenia and a paranoid personality diagnosis when you were abused by your mother, your brother, and their spouses, sister, aunt. Plus, I was stalked by three men. Uh, I was stalked by men three times. Excuse me. How? How if not be? How to not be paranoid? Or I? I, I don't know, Elizabeth. I'm I'm missing the understanding there. But I think I hear you. You're saying that if if you're experiencing post betrayal syndrome, and um. You know, you're going through trauma, PTSD, all that kind of stuff. You might get a schizophrenia or a paranoid personality diagnosis. Absolutely. I'm going to pull from that. You can. You know, you can go to a therapist who doesn't understand this kind of stuff, and they will diagnose you with schizophrenia, psychosis, paranoid personality disorder. They may even diagnose you with PTSD, believing that you are traumatized, when the reality is that, no, you're not. You're actually dealing with life. And you're having a post-betrayal syndrome kind of response. Doesn't necessarily mean you have PTSD. So that's why going to the right professional is really, really important. All right, let me keep going, guys. Yes, you're welcome. It's been cold lately. You're welcome. Thank you for all those hearts. Caribbean D, loving life's journey. Hello, welcome to the chat. Says, Tamara, I can align with solitude after betrayal from an ex close family and relatives. Yeah, absolutely. Usually, usually if you've been betrayed, the symptom of being betrayed is isolation, solace, introversion. You just kind of go within, you know what I mean? You know? And, and some of that is healthy. Some of that is healthy. Jacob Ta Jacob Ta Taylor says, oh, thank you. I have a good understanding of what is going on with my situation. Sucks, though. Trusting people is not such an issue for me, able to separate each person and their treatment of me. That's really good, Jacob Taylor. It's, it's, it's bad when you have been uh, traumatized or betrayed, and then you start kind of, you know, throwing this throwing for for lack of the correct uh, analogy, you throw this blanket over society and you say everybody's not trustworthy, right? So I like that you could separate people and you can test the spirits, as my grandma used to say. You, you get to figure out per person, what are you like? Can I trust you? You know, that's really good. Yeah, mm-hmm, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading one of your comments if you hear me agreeing with you. Rachel Murphy, hello, welcome to the chat, glad to have you, says, dealing with my mother and abusive spouse scared me so bad, I cut her off, but can't always avoid her because of family gatherings, it's either, it's either of them all out or not enjoy, oh, I think I'm understanding you saying that you can't be around this particular family member because you are around certain other family members and it's hard for you to separate from family while also protecting yourself from that family member. I hope I made sense out of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard dealing with your mother and an abusive spouse scared me so bad. I cut her off but can't always avoid her. Anytime you can't avoid the person who has caused you harm, that is difficult, you know? Um, and I have tons of videos on how to how to deal with family after you've cut them off. So I'll try to post that in the description box below for you. KW, hello, welcome to the chat, says, thank you for all your helpful content. You're an eloquent speaker and, enjoy, and I enjoy learning from you. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you on the channel too. Yeah, all of you guys are wonderful. Anytime somebody new like subscribes to my channel, um, the first thing I say is please join me live on Friday after 5 o'clock because I have such a wonderful audience. They're so supportive. And all of you mimic each other. And not, not intentionally mimic each other, but all of you sound the same uh, in how you support each other. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love seeing it. Mm, yeah. 
Jillian Maloney says, just wondering what are good examples of how to deal with your own anger? I exercise and do art sometimes, but many people have enjoyed inflicting distress. What do you all do? Yeah, that's a great question. If you guys have any tips, go ahead and add those in the chat box for Julian. Um, I, I would say, you know, sometimes something as natural as... Um, kind of incorporating a variety of natural things like essential oils can be helpful. Um, I have heard over time, over the years, that chamomile and lavender oil added to a shower, a bath, a hair product, a body spray can be kind of calming. Um, I have a kid who has a little small bottle. I don't have it with me. He left it with me today. Um, but he has a little bottle and he has lavender. He has some other interesting essential oils in there. And anytime he starts feeling a rise in anger, he sprays it. And for some reason, it's like a jolt to his memory he remembers good things positive things because because he smelled that same smell when he was somewhere positive so he uses that as a as a decompression um exercising is fantastic i also uh, for most of my clients i suggest supplemental uh options as well so things like vitamin treatments and you know really staying up on what you're putting in your body you know um i'll try to post some things in the description box for you okay just so that I don't have to go over all of this uh, during this live chat. But that's a great question. Ronald Zion, hello. Welcome to the chat. So glad to see you tonight. Says, wow, detachment is real. Detachment is really, really real. Yes, it is. Um, it's interesting. You, you know, there's a, um, in, the, in the clinical manual that we use to diagnose, uh, in the chapter for dissociation and trauma disorders, there's, there's, and I might bring this to the channel again, there's a, 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 a piece of dissociation that could actually take over your memory in such a way that it's almost like you have amnesia. And it has sometimes caused people to get in their vehicles, drive to a totally different state, and not know that they're doing it, end up in that different state, and live a life exactly you know, as they, they feel they should, and it may be totally different from what they were before. So um, I'll try to post some things for you guys if you're interested in that, but there have really and seriously been cases where people have been so dissociated from reality that they actually change their complete identity and they, 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 they lose where they are. They may even think their home is not their home and think that they live somewhere completely different than they do. It can get pretty serious. Deb says, I identify with the, uh, with the detachment and finding humor or silver, li silver linings when things are truly horrible. I think it was a saving grace. Yeah, sometimes humor is a healing piece. I use it sometimes in therapy. It's very helpful if you know how to do it gracefully. Uh, but some people laugh and find the silver lining too much. And so then they never feel the pain and they never can change because of that. So, you know, I always tell my clients, you have to feel pain in order to change sometimes. If you make everything a joke, and if you're always looking for rainbows and flowers in the garden, then you don't get a chance to heal because now what you're doing is covering the pain and you're not working through the pain. So it's figuring out, it's figuring out where you need to be, you know? So I'll keep going, I'll keep going. All right, guys, I'm going to jump back into the content so that we can wrap up in a decent time here. Let me tell you how to move forward. Some of you are probably thinking, okay, I fit all of these things. I've had, I've had, you know, post-betrayal syndrome symptoms for all of my life. I have complex PTSD. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. So what do I do? Uh, here are some things I encourage my clients to do, and this is backed by research. I'll post some of, some of it in the description box as well. But the first thing that I encourage you to do, and this is something that's going against maybe what your heart wants you to do, because once you're betrayed, you want to bring that wall up, right? But, but here's what you need to do. You almost need to face that fear by learning to trust someone, right? Giving someone your trust so that you can then have an opportunity to sharpen your skills. When you've been betrayed, the last thing you want to do is attach to the next person. But sometimes that means you're slamming the door on experience. So I encourage you, and research backs this idea, it's kind of like exposure therapy, not to slam the door on everyone because then then you kind of pigeonhole yourself, right? It, you know, it's kind of like you're saying, I want to get out of this fear, but at the same time, I'm standing up against, you know, this corner, 
and I can't get out of the corner. Well, you got to open the door so you can get out of the corner, right? So it, it's kind of like a form of exposure therapy. You, you want to at least practice trusting someone, someone. And, and see which way that relationship goes. It could even be going back to a previous relationship that was okay. You know, maybe something happened, but maybe you guys are ready to forgive each other, whatever the case may be, to open the door just a little bit may be helpful, okay? It's like a form of exposure therapy. You wanna give yourself experience to, to sharpen your skills. You don't want to allow your intuition or your ability to see through people to get dull because you've now isolated yourself so much. So keep those skills of, of sensing and understanding people alive. The other thing is you want to learn to accept that betrayal and deception will happen no matter how much you wanna protect yourself we're not immune from that, right? I, I've had betrayal even in even in my role as a therapist and I continue to, no matter how good of a therapist I am, I still experience betrayal. Sometimes clients will come into my office and play one role and then turn around and try to pull me into their legal battle, right? Uh, I once had a mom contact me, this was two years ago, contact me and say, you know, my son is depressed, he's anxious, you know, he can't sleep, he's mad because his, his dad is not in his life, we're, you know, going through a, a, a battle of divorce and custody, and I've given all my energy to that family, I've given all my sweat, blood, and tears to that family, I've educated, I've supported, I've really worried about them, I've been concerned, I've documented well, and then, next thing I know, I have something in my mail, subpoena, you know, a subpoena telling me that I need to show up in court tomorrow, right? So, so betrayal is going to happen no matter what, uh, unfortunately. So, so once you accept that deception and betrayal is likely to happen, it's not, it's, it's going to be a little bit easier to kind of move forward. Most people get stuck when they don't embrace the reality that betrayal and deception is likely to happen to them. You know, I have a client that, that, thought she was such a wonderful wife that she would never be betrayed. She thought she was his everything. And one day she learned she wasn't. So the, the betrayal hurt that much more because she didn't have that subconscious awareness that even I can be betrayed. Even I can be betrayed. It's, it's, it's taken a humble approach to the whole thing. Uh, be aware that there are people in your life that are going to attack you, manipulate you, reverse things on you, gaslight you, stonewall. They're going to do all of that, and they're going to offend you too. Again, acceptance. That's key. That's number one. Um, also, research suggests that you process and continue to process what happened to you. So you may be out of that, that, that betrayal, that relationship that betrayed you, but continue to process it because every day you grow. Every day you get new awakenings, whether you realize it or not. You know, every year, every birthday, you may learn something new about yourself. So process and reprocess what happened to you. That's a very good way to educate yourself. I love how you guys come on here and you chat and you share experiences because that is processing. What you're doing is processing your own experience and you're processing other people's experiences. And that's making you an expert. So... Uh, the other thing, too, is accept the grief process. You want to accept the fact that when you've been betrayed, there's going to be a grieving period. No one wants to be betrayed. Once you identify that you've been betrayed, accept that grieving process. You're going to miss. You're going to, you know, feel like your heart is broken. You're going to feel angry for a long time. You may even seep into a really deep, dark depression. You may also have suicidal thoughts. You may want to give up. You may isolate for months and years. Just accept that that is going to be part of the process of dealing with that betrayal. Um, and lastly, just simply decide to make a move forward. Sometimes all you need to do is process, experience the grief, and then move on. You know, the faster you can move on, the easier that betrayal that happened to you can be a, a thing of the past, right? So let me go to the chat box, guys. Those are a couple ways that I counsel my clients. I try to help them through each of those processes that I just gave you. And research also backs that process as well. I'm going to post some of it in the description box below. Okay, let me go to the chat box, guys, before we wrap up. All right, so Silent Walk, hello. Welcome to the chat. I haven't seen you in so long. Welcome, glad to have you. 
Yep. B says, my mom and brother are both May. Hopefully they're wonderful people. Not all Geminis are evil. They don't always switch either. I'm just putting that out there, B. Just putting that out there. Oh, man. I love this conversation. Oh, my God. And I love the laughing emojis. Yeah, it's been cold lately, says, that's why I want to connect and make friends again so bad. Being a loner in isolation is how I got into the situation with a stalker. No witnesses, no one there to protect. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. You also want to keep in mind, too, that when you isolate, sometimes you lose those intuitive skills that you need. I think I just said it a couple minutes ago. You want to give yourself the opportunity to continue to grow and learn. And if you slam the door on all of society and you, you kind of, you, you know, you kind of pigeonhole your yourself between your fear and that that corner that you're in then you lose the ability to to engage in relationships because your skills drop you know what i mean so that's a good point it, uh that's a good point who who said that it's been cold lately that's a really good point i'm glad you brought that up mary p poppins hello welcome to the chat i haven't seen you in so long welcome glad to see you tonight rachel murphy says i wasn't always introverted but very introverted or so much betrayal and abandonment. I wasn't always introverted, but very introverted after so much betrayal and abandonment. I am also obsessed with healing modalities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is a normal process, Rachel Murphy. It's normal. Again, accepting that process, that grief process, uh, uh, becoming introverted and, and kind of having this fear of abandonment, that's a part of the grieving process, you know? So, all right, let me keep going. Silent Walk says, big problem today with relationships and society is nobody wants to take accountability, push the blame on somebody else. Yeah, sometimes, absolutely. Sometimes that's part of it. Mm -hmm. B says, have you ever had a client that was stalked their whole life by their evil sisters and proxies and they caused and forced them into a mental institution where she was wrongfully diagnosed with? Mm hmm. I thought maybe I skipped a sentence. Mm. I've had clients that have been stalked before. And I've had clients who were 302'd or involuntarily committed to hospitals against their will by their families. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those clients feel like they've been betrayed for sure. For sure. Um, I Let me mention this too. I, I, I've only had to involuntarily commit uh, an adult, two adults in my whole 15 years of being a psychotherapist. Uh, and I've had to 302 two kids. So basically four people total. And every time the, the, the 302, for those of you who are not in my state or don't know what that is, that's putting someone in the hospital against their will. They have no say in the matter. You're going to the hospital. So anytime I've ever had to put somebody in the hospital against their will, including my own stalker, some seven or six years ago, uh, and my, my stalker was a psychotic stalker who was a patient, a client, uh, who had become obsessed with me, uh, because their children, uh, had really kind of put me in the role of like the savior because the family was going through a divorce and the children kind of pushed me in the spotlight of, you know, we're going to do everything Miss Tamara tells us to do because we just absolutely love her. And that made the parents, one of the parents, very, very uh, jealous and uh, begrudging and and uh, vengeful. And then it ended up being a situation where I was stopped. Um, I, I would get at least 10 or 11 phone calls in one day and one day. And that went on for months until I put a stop to it, which is the voluntary uh, process of hospitalization. I had to put that person in the hospital against their will uh, after the 100th phone call that I received um, and and threats to come to my, my practice, my group practice that I was a part of at the time. So involuntary commitment, right? You're, you're, you're going in there without a say. Um, that whole process can feel like a betrayal. I've put somebody in the hospital, four people in the hospital against their will. And every single time I have to go to, through the process of doing that, it feels like I'm betraying that person, except for the stalker. But it feels like I'm betraying that person. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. 
So yes, B. Yes. Being in a mental institution against your will can feel like post. It can feel like a, a betrayal. Um, Morse Venture Channel. Hello, welcome to the channel. Hope I said that correctly. Welcome says I. Hello, I'm sorry I'm late. You are not late. Glad to have you. I appreciate you signing on. I'm glad you're here. Hopefully you got something from the chat box while I was rambling earlier. All right, I'm just going through comments. I don't want to miss anything before we wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Jessica J. Jessica J says, I've taken hot bubble baths with candles and relaxation videos. They are helpful for me. Yeah, absolutely. Put some lavender oil in that bath water too, like lavender, chamomile, um, there's clove. Um, it's, it, it's all good. It's all good. It's all healthy. Thank you for that, Jessica. Yeah, hello anyways. Welcome to the track. Glad to see you. Says, this has happened to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, head up bear. I hope that's correct. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you says I often have this need of justice after all that betrayal and abuse. It feels like a betrayal from society, not getting that too. what makes me even trust less and less people again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, again, and I don't know if you were here at the very beginning of the live chat. Th there's a thing called second level trauma. First level trauma is being betrayed by somebody that you trust, your husband, your parents, your caregiver, your adopted parents, your foster parents, whatever. Those are the people that you are like this with, right? You trust them. They betray you. And then the institution betrays you. Um, let's say, for example, you had a very trusting relationship with your mother and somewhere she betrayed you. So that trusting relationship breaks apart. And then right? And then you end up in the foster care system and that system betrays you. That is second level trauma. Another example might be you're in a very loving marriage or relationship and you really love that person and that person really loves you. But after 25 years of marriage, something has gone out, right? The candlelight has gone out. It's dim. It's gone. And so now that husband has an affair um, and then domestic violence starts up. You needing help go to the police and say, I'm being beat. I'm being hurt. Please go arrest him. And what do the police say? Do you have any proof? Uh, why didn't you file charges last Wednesday when he beat you? You know, there's second level trauma. There you go. It's the system. The system betrays you and somebody very close to you betrays you. It's all bad. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth says, I love lemongrass. Yeah, me too. Me too. Put some lemongrass uh, essential. This is not for the guys on the channel, but you can if you want. Put some lemongrass essential oil in a spray bottle and just spritz it over your pillows and all of that. You know, the aroma can be very relaxing. But you want to spritz it with a little bit of water in there because it's kind of, it's concentrated. Anthony D says, what do you do when everyone you know yeah, has betrayed you. It's like all your friends were horrible people. Yeah, absolutely. There's no answer for that, Anthony D. I wish I had it. You know, I wish I also had it for myself, right? Um, so I don't think we have an answer as to, you know, what do you do when this happens? I think my suggestion, though, would be when it's hard to figure out how to to make sense out of the betrayal drop it and then move forward because sometimes the reason for the betrayal doesn't even make sense at all right it shouldn't even ever happened maybe you were connected to the wrong people maybe those people were jealous of you maybe maybe you know maybe i don't know you need to be around different kinds of people whatever the case may be we may not have an answer um, but, but once you realize, okay, I don't understand how to make sense out of that, move on. That's, that's what I tell my clients to do. If you can't understand the betrayal, and if the betrayal has been with people you've always loved and trusted and you can't make sense out of it, move on. Because it's almost like you're beating yourself over the head. You're, ba you're, you're battering yourself. You know what I mean? Damien Bender, hello. Welcome to the chat. I'm glad you could catch a live as well. Yes, I'm glad. Always glad to see you guys. Moros or Morse Venture Channel says, my mom betrayed me. She's friends with the man who did terrible things with me. Oh, that's awful. That's awful. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I have kids that come to see me where they've been sexually abused and the mother is still married to that man or the mother is still dating that man behind the back of everybody that knows that child was sexually abused. It's a very sick dynamic. All right. I'm just scrolling through to make sure I haven't missed anyone. Because we're going to sign off, guys. I'm going to sign off. I got to go.
Yeah. Mary Poppins says, I am 80% healed. Whoops. I'm 80% healed. So hard headed now. I'm back to reach 100%. I'm really ready. Now, hello. Thank you for helping us with your love. And I don't know what that means. Mary Poppins, I love your comment. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I think it's wonderful. 80% healed. That's success. That's success for sure. Ah, silent walk. Says so chosen ones generally get thrown under the bus because we are a bit different than the normal, the normies. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, absolutely. Absolutely. Special people, special people sometimes do get thrown under the bus a lot quicker than other people. Absolutely. Yeah, Elizabeth, my mom's a Libra. My mom's a Libra. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Whoa. Before I sign off, 451 roster. Wait, 4514 roster. Hello. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says, I'm sorry this happened to you. One trick I used to do was I would play the do to do this number, no longer exists tone, on like a TV or a friend's phone and record that as your voicemail. Oh my goodness. That's a good comment. I have no comment. I have no comment. I don't. That's a good comment. I'm going to leave it at that. Dawn One says, I've experienced all of the symptoms you've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I believe you. I believe you. Keep in mind, guys, that if you've experienced neuroticism, emotional detachment, dissociation, psychosis, borderline personality-like behaviors, uh, and PTSD or one of those, um, Keep in mind that it's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to heal. It's not impossible. It's just going to be a little more difficult. And the duration to heal may be a little longer than other people. So I want to throw that in there. Marthea Wells, hello. Welcome to the chat. Glad to see you here as well. I'm signing off in literally two seconds. Christina Lozano, hello. Welcome to the chat. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, you guys have awesome comments. Yeah, have a great weekend. It's been cold lately. Thank you for stopping in. Love to see you. Um, okay, I'm going to sign off here, guys. Love you so much. I say that all the time. You guys are wonderful, wonderful people. I don't know how I got blessed with so many of you wonderful sub subscribers. I mean, I love you guys. You are just wonderful. So uh, thank you for contacting me behind the scenes and um, supporting me and helping me with my concussion. Some of you have been so lovely to email me like, eat this and eat that and try this and you know. So thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you for chatting tonight and, and supporting each other. I hope you guys have a safe and wonderful week, a weekend. I'm probably going to leave this up. I'm probably not going to do a live chat. I don't know. We'll see. I think this live chat is going to be pretty important so I'm going to leave it up. I don't know if we're going to do a video on Sunday but I'll save. Um, okay. Have a great weekend, guys. I will see you soon. I don't know when, but I'll see you within the next week or so. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.